Number 10, Man Thing. Man Thing was created by Stan Lee, Roy Thomas, Jerry Conway, and Greg Moreau in the 1970s. He is a swamp-like creature that really just wants to be left alone in peace. His real name is Dr. Theodore Salas, who has been working on a project with other doctors to try and basically recreate the super soldier serum. He breaks protocol by bringing the woman he loves into the lab with him to see his work. But it turns out that she betrays him for the group AIM. <sighs> Poor guy. But after this betrayal, Theodore leaves the facilities, injects himself with the serum that he had been working on, and ends up crashing into the swamp where he gets transformed into Man-Thing. His mind is basically gone with only small glimpses of it appearing throughout the comics. He's been part of groups like Legion of Monsters and Stakes, Howling Commandos. Number nine, Morbius. Morbius the Living Vampire was created in the 1970s and is actually having an upcoming live action film starring Jared Leto. But right now it seems more like Sony is trying to connect to the MCU rather than the MCU actually connecting with them. Yeah, it's a little confusing, but we'll move on. Anyways, Morbius was created by Roy Thomas and Jill Kane. Before he was known as Morbius the Living Vampire, he was a doctor named Michael Morbius, who has a rare blood condition that affected his entire body, making him very, very weak. He wanted to find a cure and using this knowledge began experimenting on potential treatments that could help him and defeat this disease. Unfortunately, he did not get the outcome he desired. He began testing using bats and electroshock therapy to try to cure this disease. The treatment worked, but the side effects of this test truly left a mark on Morbius. This started Morbius' transformation into what he appears like today, looking like a vampire combined with a bat. Number eight, Cloak. Usually when referring to Cloak, it would be Cloak and Dagger. But in this case, we are focusing solely on Cloak. Now, Cloak can access the Dark Force dimension, which gives him access to absorb the life forces of others. He can also use the Dark Force dimension to create a field of darkness around him and anyone affected by this energy can see dark, crazy visions and also feel very numb and scared. If Cloak has anyone in this dimension while well, he is draining their life force and doesn't allow them to exit this realm, they will die. Now, they did have a Cloak and Dagger TV series on Freeform, but it was ultimately cancelled and not connected or tied into the MCU in any way. Number 7, Black Bolt. Black Bolt made his first appearance in the 1960s and was created by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. He is a member of a group called the Inhumans. Black Bolt's strongest ability is his voice, which is so powerful that he can destroy anything in its way. Now, we were very close to getting an Inhumans movie in the MCU, which was supposed to come out before Avengers Endgame, but that got scrapped and instead got turned into a show for ABC. The series had received very mixed reviews and later got cancelled after one season. The series itself did not seem connected to the MCU in any way, shape, or form. Whether or not they will try to adapt the Inhuman into the MCU is yet to be seen, but, I mean, fingers are crossed. Number 6, Ghost Rider. So there have been many different Ghost Riders throughout the comics and adaptations, but the first one was and most popular is Johnny Blaze. Johnny is a stunt motorcycle driver who agrees to give his soul to Satan, aka Mephisto, in order to save his father from death. When Johnny Blaze turns into Ghost Rider, it is at night around evil. His flesh goes on fire and his whole body and head turns to a skeleton, fully engulfed in flames, and the motorcycle he rides is set on fire as well. He can wield fire as his weapon, and he has had adaptations in the movies and recently in the television series Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. with Robbie Reyes as the Ghost Rider. Now again, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. has never really connected back to the MCU. We did have some characters near the beginning crossing over with the show, but we never had any characters from the show cross over into the movies, and it felt more like an isolated series, more that's kind of stood on its own apart from the MCU. Halfway through into number 5, Red Sun Superman. The Russian hero known as Superman is an alternate version of the hero we know now. From an alternate reality in which baby kal landed not in Smallville, but rather in Soviet Russia, where he was raised by the government. This Superman, while still a hero to the to Russia is antithetical to the United States and has defeated some American heroes such as the Green Lantern. His arch nemesis though is still Lex Luthor, who at this point is a scientist employed by the US government to create heroes like Superman. Luthor's copied version of Superman however proves a failure and endangers more lives. <coughs> Bizarro. Luthor created many monsters to battle Superman, but they all didn't really do anything. This version is just scary because like, it's what every American fears. Communism. And honestly, with some of the other characters on this list and what they did to the human race, I'm like on this earth I'm surprised that Russia hasn't used Superman to just destroy everything. Like, whatever. However, this story is a good lesson about who you keep in your life and how people around you affect who you turn out to be. So, 
There's that, at least. And at 4, Reverse Flashpoint Superman. In Tales from the Dark Multiverse 1 Flashpoint, we see a world where Barry died when trying to get his speed back with Thomas Wayne after creating Flashpoint. This leads to Reverse Flash claiming to be the Flash and then trying to get the war with the Atlanteans and Amazons to stop by threatening them. Obviously, this doesn't work out so well. So in an effort to save himself, Reverse Flash races through time, changing the events to create the world exactly how he wants it, with Barry not being able to stop him. Which involves saving not only Bruce Wayne, but Martha and Thomas Wayne as well, resulting in a world without a Batman. On the final page of the issue, we see Eobard with all the new heroes he ended up creating and convincing them to join him, as we can tell by the Reverse Flash symbols on their suits. Even Green Lanterns and Wonder Woman has one. This page also has a Superman, and honestly, sick suit, but being controlled, or I guess led by the reverse Flash, makes this utterly horrifying to think about, especially when you can see the other members of the Flash family racing behind reverse Flash. He finally got what he wanted. Eobard Thawne became the Flash. Getting close to the end in at number 3, Ultraman. A member of the crime syndicate, an evil version of the Justice League that terrorized its Earth, that being Earth 3, Ultraman is basically the opposite to Superman. His real name, well his real human name, is Clark Luthor, and is the adopted son of Lionel Luthor from Earth 2. Ultraman is cal -ul with two L's, who comes from a version of Krypton whose people are mean-spirited and selfish. Unlike other incarnations, they gain power when exposed to green kryptonite. Just before his Krypton was destroyed, Kal-El's parents, jor -El and Lara, send him to Earth-3 to one day seek vengeance against the being that destroyed Krypton, teaching him to become the strongest being on the planet or to become nothing at all. Upon his arrival on Earth-3, the young Kal-El coursed a couple of young uh, alcoholic uh, substance addicts, Johnny and Martha Kent, to adopt him, only to murder them years later once he no longer needed them. He went on to found the crime syndicate and take over the world. This guy is a homicidal, violent megalomaniac with mommy and daddy issues. However, he's definitely a character I want to see on the big screen. Please. Penultimately, in at number 2, Overman. Overman is an alternate version of Superman from a different world in the multiverse, obviously. But unlike other versions of Superman, his primary language is German. This is because on this Earth, the German soldiers won World War II, to speak around the YouTube censors, eventually taking over the planet and spreading German everywhere, as in like the language. Another Overman first appeared in Grant Morrison's Animal Man number 23. He is one among several pre-crisis characters that were returned to reality by the Psycho Pirate's Medusa Mask. This Overman comes from an Earth based around the grim and gritty stories of the 1980s, and the heroes of this universe were actually a part of an experiment created by the government. Overman... <laughs> This has got to be one of the most ridiculous points that I saw, but Overman went mad and destructive after contracting an STD. Not even kidding. And the other inhabitants of this earth were a black and muscular Wonder Woman, an unnamed Flash, and a punk style Green Lantern. Psycho Pirate pointed out how ridiculous this universe is, but I mean, come on, it's still pretty terrifying. And Overgirl was ruthless on Crisis on Earth X, okay? Finally, and at number one, Injustice. Injustice is probably one of the most popular alternate Earth stories of this generation. Thanks to the Mortal Kombat inspired fighting game by the same name, this is an Earth where Joker managed to trick Superman into thinking that he was fighting Doomsday when he was actually killing his wife Lois Lane. That was already bad enough since we know how Superman gets in other worlds when his wife dies. However, this time she was also carrying his unborn child, which he only found out after accidentally killing her. This sent Superman into a fit of rage and caused him to kill the Joker while Batman was intimidating him much to Batman's dismay. This one action caused Superman to go absolutely berserk and to do the one thing that Batman and everyone else feared, use his power and become the governor of the world. Through this regime, Superman killed anyone who committed a crime, resulting in Batman leading a resistance of other superheroes, not all of whom who made it. While the story in the video games remains largely the same of that of the comics it generated, there are a few differences like the amount of deaths in the comics, since none of them are really playable characters so losing them won't really affect your gameplay experience. Either way, the scariest version of Superman we've seen today, although almost tied with the one who was using guns. Number 10, Reverend Bruce Wayne. Reverend Bruce isn't particularly scary to begin with, but the world he comes from and the fight he fights is 
definitely scary. This is a version of Batman who isn't just taking up the mantle to fight his parents killers and rid Gotham of crime, but instead is attempting to fight against a whole political and societal system. In the Elseworlds story Batman Holy Terror, the course of history is changed somewhat so that America is basically still part of the commonwealth. As such it turns out that the seemingly random mugging and murder of Bruce's parents was not actually so random and was actually a government hit that was later made to look like a mugging gone wrong. When Reverend Bruce finds out about this he dons a demon costume that once belonged to his father Thomas and sets out to investigate. He also goes on to find out about government run human experiments and an alien whom they captured, raised and later killed with green rocks when he became too hard to control. Poor would be Superman. Number 9 Gods and Monsters Batman This version of Batman is not Bruce Wayne but is instead Kirk Langstrom. In this reality there is no Bruce Wayne to take up the mantle and so Kirk ends up with the name himself. Not because he was inspired by a bat smashing through a window of course, but because he is kind of actually part vampire bat. Kirk was a brilliant scientist who was working on a cure for lymphoma. He eventually figured out how to create this cure using bat saliva and nanotech to strengthen his experimental treatment. However, while it succeeded in curing his cancer, it also turned Kirk into a pseudo vampire. While he remains a hero and typically only ingests artificially created plasma or even animals blood, which can also help him to survive, he has also been known to feed on criminals from time to time. He's like these criminals, nah, I got to eat. They kind of deserve it. I'm just going to eat them. And friends, before we move on to our next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more scary alternate Batman lists of which, let's be real, there's a lot of scary alternate Batman out there. Be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Spooky thumbs up. Spooky spook. Number 8, DCEU Batman or Batfleck if you prefer. Ben Affleck's Batman from Batman vs Superman especially is a much darker figure in comparison to the comics and kind of in comparison to a lot of other bat men that have been on the big screen. This is a version of the hero who has decided that he is willing to kill when he needs to. All in all it seems to be implied that the death of Jason Todd is what reshaped Batman's morals here and caused him to readjust his code. Not only does he kill but he also does something even worse in my opinion, branding some of the worst criminals that he fights against with a literal bat brand. These are the criminals that Batman has deemed to have done something completely unforgivable. And the thing is is that people in prison in Gotham also know the significance of the Bat brand, meaning that those who end up with one are basically marked for death. The idea here is that the inmates will carry out the death sentence that Batman has marked them with because they know that whatever this person did, it was one of the worst crimes, otherwise they wouldn't have this brand. So not only is there an extra layer of fear, but this also shows a complete disregard for human life. I mean, at least a disregard for human life when it comes to really, really terrible criminals. Batman wants these criminals to live in fear and he doesn't care what happens to them in prison. In fact, he kind of hopes that they end up dead. Number 7, Batman the Silenced. One perfect spine chilling dark multiverse tale that I have loved, which even comes with its own creepy lullaby, ugh, is the tales from the dark multiverse Batman Hush. In this story we get a reimagined narrative where Batman's childhood friend Thomas Elliot is the one who ends up messing up Bruce's life. Tommy in his adult years allies himself with many of Gotham's villains and more usually anti-hero types after Bruce Wayne ends up in Arkham Asylum, which also was kind of part of his doing. So, However, Bruce isn't quite as checked out as he's been pretending to be and he ends up escaping in order to get revenge and taking up the mantle of Batman the Silence, an alternate version basically of Hush and of course an alternate version of Batman. Number 6. Vampire Batman This alternate version of Batman comes to us from the alternate Earth 43. As his moniker describes, he is a version of Bruce Wayne who transforms into a more literal version of Batman when he becomes a vampire. Batman. Get it? Because vampire bats. Oddly enough, this is also not the only version of Batman in the multiverse that also happens to be a vampire, as you already know, because we talked about gods and monsters. Batman as well, who's also a vampire. Despite being a vampire on Earth 43, Bruce still fights on the good side, fighting against his vampiric urges to feed on human blood. At least, 
Initially, he fights against them. At one point, Vampire Bats asks Alfred to stake him in order to prevent him from giving in to his bloodlust, after he seemingly killed the Joker by draining him of all of his blood. However, a stake through the heart doesn't actually kill Batman here, but simply leaves him in a coma. Months later, Gotham is in a pretty bad place without Batman's presence, and Alfred is forced to awaken him in hopes that Gotham will once more have a savior. Batman does go about taking out criminals, but in a very vampiric way, creating a bloodbath as his time staked and his bodily decay has resulted in the loss of his sanity. So he's there and he's killing criminals, but he's like killing criminals and it's like a lot. Halfway through into number 5, Black Lantern Reverse Flash. The Black Lantern Corps is a group of various dead superheroes and villains alike who were raised by Necron and each given a Black Lantern ring. This ring grants them power over death and these rings are powered by the Anti-Monitor as he is present within the Black Lantern power battery. Those raised by the Black Lantern ring are in essence resurrected to where they were before death but their mind is warped to serve Necron's purpose. Those with the ring have various powers including a healing factor, aura recognition which allows them to see powerful emotions emotions, energy spectrum assimilation which lets them extract the hearts of individuals that they've slain and then use their last feelings to charge the central battery and their ring by 0.1% and they, much like zombies, can infect others by biting them. A bite from a black lantern will slowly kill the one bitten and then would turn them into black lanterns upon death. Basically zombies with superpowers in addition to being an evil speedster, so definitely not something that you should be trifling with. And in 4, Johnny Quick. Johnny Allen also known as Johnny Quick, is a criminal speedster from Earth 3. Together with his girlfriend and partner in crime Atomica, he was a member of the crime syndicate. Johnny Allen was a high profile criminal, on the run with his equally criminal girlfriend when he was cornered on the roof of Central City Star Labs. Allen was struck by a bolt of lightning which shattered the roof and the duo fell into the lab space below. With Allen landing amid the chemicals, something in this incident granted him super speed and went on to become a powerful super criminal alongside his girlfriend who also had been empowered. Well, his girlfriend took the name Atomica, he took on the name Johnny Quick. And he ran through the city, answering to no one, until the day the White House burned. Around the time of Darkseid's incursion into Prime Earth, the being that had destroyed Ultraman's Krypton came to Earth, and an alliance of super criminals formed to find a way to safety. Now my question is, is Johnny Quick the reason Johnny Quick became a speedster. There's the whole like storyline where Barry Allen runs so fast that he like disintegrates, but then he also time travels and becomes the bolt of lightning that gives him his powers. So technically, did that also happen to Johnny? Getting close to the end in number three, Godspeed. August Hart is the former detective partner of Barry Allen. August was the only witness to Barry's accident that turned him into the Flash. While going after a criminal organization called the Black Hole, August was also struck by lightning during a speed force storm in Central City. So August became the ruthless vigilante known as Godspeed, and got revenge on the one who he suspected to be his brother's killer. He had given up on the justice system since his brother's killer had gone free, and with his newfound power and the ability to become judge, jury, and vibrating executioner, August realized that after he had gotten his powers that he also had the ability to steal other speedsters' speed. Though for a time he could only do it by killing them, he practiced the skill enough to be able to do it non-lethally as well. With his new godlike speed, August was able to move so fast as to create a duplicate of himself at any given time, allowing him to give the illusion that he and Godspeed were different people, which is pretty damn sick, considering the alternatives are Speed Mirage and Time Remnant, which aren't technically the same thing. Time Remnants just create evil versions of yourself, apparently. Penultimately, and at number 2, Black Flash. The actual physical representation of death for all speedsters, they just can't see this guy coming. Okay, well, they, they can, but you know what I mean. Black Flash is the Grim Reaper of the Speed Force. Making his first appearance in the Flash Volume 2, number 138 from 1998, he was was seen before the deaths of several speedsters, including Barry Allen, Johnny Quick, and Bart Allen. He also tried to return Wally West to the Speed Force, however was unsuccessful, taking Linda Park instead, Wally's girlfriend. Which after past experiences, Wally, I feel like he probably did you a favor. But since he was unsuccessful the first time, Black Flash returned to try to claim Wally again, freezing time for everyone without a connection to the Speed Force. But thanks to the combined efforts of multiple speedsters, including Max Mercury, Jay Garrick, Jesse Quick, and Wally, Wally was able to race Black Flash to the end of time, causing death to have no meaning. In the CW, Black Flash was Hunter Zolomon after the season 2 finale, and was killed during season 3 when Savitar lured him out of the Speed Force and Killer Frost froze him, resulting in her first kill that actually turned out to be her ex as well. Dare I say, 
ice cold. But that didn't stop the Speed Force anyway, since later Barry Allen returned in the Flash Rebirth storyline in the comics, becoming the new Black Flash, until Professor Zoom took over the title after his corpse was raised in the Darkest Night storyline. There's a lot of things going on. Finally, in at number one, Red Death. Red Death is a speedster that is an evil combination of Batman and the Flash, which already sounds terrifying, but wait until you hear his story. The Bruce Wayne of Earth 52 started off fighting crime with Robin, but Robin's kept dying left, right, and center. So understandably, he got darker and darker, becoming more extreme with his, um, let's call them methods, shall we? Which honestly seems realistic to me, aside from just quitting to fight crime, but that can't happen, otherwise they wouldn't have a story, right? And DC wouldn't make any money. This eventually leads him to Barry, who refuses to give Bruce his speed, so Batman uses uses the various rogues gallery weapons to fight Barry, knocking him out, and then tying him to the front of a cosmic treadmill powered Batmobile and drives them both into the speed force. I don't even know how that happened, logically, or why that would have worked in their world, but whatever. You do you, Bat Marty. We gotta get you back to the future. When entering the speed force, Barry and Bruce end up fusing together into an evil Batman with super speed and a lust for killing, while Barry's mind was trapped in Bruce's body. He then gets a visit from the Batman who laughs, who just makes him even even crazier and wants to help him help conquer the universe or the multiverse even so yeah that's that he's number one number 10 dirty bomb Wolverine why does this sound like some sort of sexy nickname for Wolverine it really is not instead this alternate version of Wolverine is an empty clone that was created in the current Wolverine series and used to basically burn vampires loyal to Dracula from the inside out this all went down in a battle in the effort of freeing Omega Red from Dracula's hold over him while also getting back at Drac who was attempting to get his hands on Wolverine so he could use his blood to allow his own vampire army to walk around during the day, making them obviously much more powerful. Omega Red's plan to stop Dracula was to give him what he wanted, which meant making a clone of Wolverine who was gene edited to have blood that was thick with photonic cells, similar to the ones found in Plankton which produced their own luminescence. Basically the blood of the dirty bomb clone Wolverine then had the opposite effect on the vamps who consumed it meaning they would be burnt from the inside out as opposed to being able to walk in the day. Having a gene edited clone of Wolverine is a frightening prospect and a clone who is used simply as a decoy and bomb is pretty morally scary. And then there is the added factor of how it made the vampires feel to learn of it. And I'm sure that they were properly terrified before they were all killed. Minus Dracula of course who got away in the end like he always does. Although the mutants won the battle in issue number 12 of the current Wolverine series, they did not win the war. Still continues with the vampire nation. Number 9. Dark Claw. If you find the Batman scary, and I mean, who doesn't? He is often drawn with the intention of looking intimidating and scary enough to strike fear into the hearts of goons and villains all across Gotham. Then take a seat because Dark Claw is definitely going to spook you a bit here. Dark Claw comes to us from the Amalgam universe where he was created as a cross between Marvel's Wolverine and DC's Batman, blending together two of the big two's most popular and frightening heroic characters. He's got the backstory and fortune of Batman, but still boasts of the adamantium coated skeleton and healing factor of Wolverine. Meaning that Logan Wayne is not an alternate version that you would want to mess with. And all my ghouls out there, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more Wolverine lists, be sure to let us know by clicking that like button and commenting down below. Also if you click like and if you smash subscribe, you can call me Vampy. Number 8. Phoenix. One of the most terrifying versions of Wolverine in terms of what he could be capable of has to be the Wolverine from the alternate future where Thor ends up as all father and Loki wipes out all of humanity just to make his brother suffer of course in this dystopian future Wolverine himself ends up being chosen to become the new host for the Phoenix Force after his own death Phoenix Logan was obviously capable of many different insane feats due to him being imbued with well the Phoenix Force, even managing to save Loki from the Celestials. Pretty impressive. However, Phoenix Wolverine would prove to be not quite as scary when facing a future version of Doom who obliterated him. But Logan, being imbued with the power of the Phoenix Force, meant that he could resurrect and in order to ensure that Doom would be defeated this time around, he sacrificed himself to empower all Father Thor's weapon Mjolnir in the continued battle. Also, that would be the one really powerful Mjolnir. It's like Mjolnir with the Phoenix Force. That's crazy. Number 7, Akahiro. Sure, 
Sure, Dokken is a character all his own, but I also counted a clone that was used as a dirty bomb against vampires, so I feel like if I do that, it would be really insulting if we did not talk about Akihiro. Dokken was an alternate version of Wolverine during Dark Reign, where Norman Osborn basically took over in the comics, where he forged the organization Hammer and there and his very own Dark Avengers. The Dark Avengers were made up of former and current villains repurposed and remarketed as Avengers replacements. Osborn actually tried to recruit some of the original Avengers after they'd been disbanded, but of course they pretty much all refused. They were like, we know you're Norman Osborn, so. Dokken was recruited to be Dark Wolverine on the team, and while Akihiro might not be quite as villainous in the comics currently, at the time, he was still pretty much one of the baddies. Dokken is a terrifying alternate because he is less of a moral code than his dad, who already isn't known for his light touch when it comes to dealing with his opponents. Dokken, like his father, is also a skilled fighter and assassin who was trained since he was a child to become a killer and a weapon for Romulus to use against Logan. Oh, and if you're not familiar with him, he also has pretty much all the powers of his dad. His claws are just a little bit different. Actually, Dokken also has pheromone powers, so he's not really more powerful than his dad in terms of skill, but power set. Just saying. Number 6. Wolverine Noir Jim Logan is one of the noir versions of Wolverine that we see in the Marvel Noirverse. Another shows up in the X-Men Noir series, but with a different backstory and also kind of a different name. He's a bootlegger, but the one we're focusing on here is a detective. Honestly, a lot of the noir versions of heroes are detectives. But back then in the stories, everyone was a detective, so I'm fine with it. Either way, I personally think that narrative fits Wolverine's power set just a little bit better, being a skilled tracker himself. Jim in Wolverine Noir is part of Logan and Logan, a detective agency that boasts that they're the best there is at what we do. The whole look of the series is very creepy, very noir, and it also draws a lot on the backstory of Wolverine given to us in his origin series where we learn of how he was mistreated as a boy, his relationship to Dog, and his childhood love and friend, Rose. In this version of the story, Logan's father is a very religious preacher who often forces young Jim to sit and listen to his sermons while he rehearses them. Halfway through in at number 5, Man Spider. Man Spider is the mutated form of Spider-Man which appeared in both the comics and the 1990s animated series, with his original appearance actually coming from the animated series. In the 90s cartoon, Spider-Man's transformation into the Man Spider was not caused deliberately like it was in the comics, but as a result of his body mutating further from the original spider bite that gave him his power. Hours. After his attempts to ask Professor X and the X-Men for help developing a cure meet with failure, Spider-Man turned to his friend Dr. Mariah Crawford for aid. Unfortunately, his initial attempt to cure himself resulted in him accelerating the actual mutation process and growing four new arms. The accelerated mutation subsequently caused him to mutate into the Man-Spider after fighting the Punisher and a recently mutated Michael Morbius. The mutated Spider-Man retained some of his memories and his emotional responses to seeing loved ones or people who reminded him of his loved ones but could not communicate with them. Eventually, during the final episode of the storyline called Neurogenic Nightmare, Dr. Connors reprogrammed devices that Vulture was using to absorb youth from other people and caused him to give Peter back his spider powers but not the mutation, resulting in the Vulture mutating into Man Spider, although somehow he had gotten rid of this mutation off screen later in the series. It's also worth noting that the introduction of Man Spider in the comics, which was thanks to this animated series, is actually what introduced the biological web shooters from Sam Raimi. Spider-Man into the comics as well. And at 4, Spider Carnage. Spider Carnage is my favorite alternate version of Spider-Man. Also being introduced in the Spider-Man animated series in the 1990s like the Man-Spider from last number, this version of Peter Parker shared most of his early life with his superhero counterpart. However, the difference between these two was that Aunt May at some point died as well, being buried next to Uncle Ben. Thanks to some messing around with interdimensional portals by Jonathan Ohm, a version of a Carnage symbiote from another universe sensed this Peter's anger and latched onto him, turning him into the the Spider Carnage, a version of Spider-Man with the Carnage symbiote, if you couldn't tell. A villain set on revenge and the destruction of all realities. Spider Carnage is one of the coolest iterations of Spider-Man to date, in my opinion, and it's part of the reason I love the 90s cartoon so much. I watch it all the way through just so I can see Spider Carnage at the end. And while there is a version from the comics just called the Spider, which is Spider-Man with the Carnage symbiote, this version wanted to destroy literally everything, so um, yes please, this is certainly the scarier of the two, just saying. Sorry comic lovers. Hey, look, I like the comics too, but Spider Carnage is 
definitely worse than the spider. Getting close to the end at number 3, Patient Zero Spider-Man. After the Punisher accidentally released Survivor 118, a chemical designed to help people adapt to a post-apocalyptic environment, Spider-Man was the first to show symptoms from it after he ate the rhino during a hockey game. The Fantastic Four subdued him shortly afterwards and put him in a cage for experimentation, but Ben Grimm also succumbed to the plague himself and freed Spider-Man from captivity, though the exact reason why he did that is unknown. As he escapes into the city, he briefly fought Wolverine and the Punisher, but soon the world would start to fall apart and heroes and villains alike would become cannibals, eventually leaving the Punisher as the only hero left to fight them. A turf war erupted among the emerging tribes of cannibals, due in part to the King of Death's manipulations in an attempt to thin the herd, but Spider-Man, now referred to as Patient Zero, was the most successful and took control of all of Manhattan for his own tribe, while the others left to stake new lands. They had to go and they had to conquer other places. Especially given the recent world issues though, I think that this is certainly something that I can say a good majority of people are afraid of. Although I bet that there are some survivors on this earth that say Survivor 118, that the Survivor 118 plague is fake calling it. But ultimately, in at number 2, Wolf Spider. At an unknown time in this universe, Wolf Spider gained spider-like powers, but unlike most other realities Peter Parker, he became a villain, remorselessly killing this universe's Miles Morales and everyone who stood for heroism and responsibility. Cuz, you know, that's what that's the, we're bad guys, it's what we do. First appearing in the Ultimate Spider-Man cartoon in season 4 episode 16, this guy isn't even the villain of just one world. After finding a shard of the Siege Perilous, he traveled through dimensions to find the rest. One of these dimensions was Blood Spider. Spider's homeworld, where he allied himself with the Lizard King. After turning almost everyone into vampires, with which is weird because I mean it was called the Lizard King. Well, would you, wouldn't you want to turn them into lizards? But whatever. He and the Lizard King hatched a plan to block out the sun so that vampires could just roam free on the Earth. And this sounds very Dongard Volkahar clan to me. Okay, Peter. Like, what are you gonna what you gonna tell me that you need to find Oriel's bow next and like a daughter of Cold Harbor? I don't know. Skyrim. Wolf Spider, though, was cold and ruthless and obsessed with gathering the shards of Siege Perilous, and seemed to have a grudge against Spider-Man and every Miles Morales. An evil Peter Parker is always a scary thing. And finally, in at number one, Spider's Man. Peter Parker of Earth 11580 was once a promising young student. Invited by Max Modal alongside his best friend Gwen Stacy to tour his bleeding edge company at Horizon Labs. One of the experiments the pair observed was a massive colony of spiders that Modell was bombarding with numerous radioactive particles in the name of genetic alteration. Parker, of course, fell into this colony where he seemed to be devoured, but in the process, the spiders became a singular hive mind construct that absorbed Peter's consciousness. So they started masquerading as the man they absorbed. The hive, calling themselves Spider's Man, put on the Spider-Man costume and began to fight crime in cruel York. First appearing in spider get in number 3, I absolutely hate the idea of a whole human being made of spiders because that's just up. Look, I'm arachnophobic except for the odd time where I need to impress someone, but it's absolutely horrific to think of any being made entirely of spiders, okay? I would actually rather die. Even if this is a good guy, no fing way am I looking at this man and saying, oh yeah, let's let him help us. No, he can go burn with the rest of the spider species as they fing should, okay? There we have it, friends, the top 10 scary alternate versions of Spider Man. Which version of Spider Man is the scariest to you, and which is your favorite? And it better be Sweatpants Onesie Spider Man, which is me. In a 10, Headpool. Little is known about Deadpool's life before the zombie plague arrived on Earth 2149. At some point though he was infected and he attacked the Silver Surfer. He most likely fled the attack but also escaped the power cosmic zombies from getting himself incinerated and killed. He later was transported from Earth 2149 to Earth 616 calling himself the Merc with half a mouth due to his lack of most of his jaw and exhibiting a wide range of knowledge. However he was torn apart by some blades after Kale put some tricky maneuvers resulting in Deadpool now reduced to only a head and being contained within armor. He managed to escape from armor headquarters with the help of Simon Garth by using the base teleporters to escape to the bottom of the sea where Deadpool's head infected all of the men fish. Garth was compelled to travel to the island nation of Tiano in the Caribbean Sea where he told Black Talon about the zombie plague. But like, look, normal Deadpool is bloodthirsty enough, but a zombie version that gets reduced to only a head and then still keeps going? That's freaking nuts. I'm also gonna not try to hold back my swears because it's Deadpool. It's f***ing Deadpool. So, sorry editor who has to deal with this. No, it's fine. It's 
fine. And at 9, Dead Man Wade. Obsessed with feeling pain, Dead Man Wade Wilson became one of Apocalypse's pale riders, a team formed by Apocalypse's chief assassins. His teammate, Daniel Moonstar, took great pleasure in inflicting pain upon him. Pretty kinky. But when Apocalypse learned that Nightcrawler was seeking out Avalon, he sent Wade and the other pale riders to follow him and destroy the refuge. Along the way, Danielle's torture of Wade annoyed their teammate Damask to the point where she strangled Moonstar to death. Watching that woman get killed unnerved Wayne even further. However, this version of Wade is also in constant pain, and even though he is in constant pain, his healing factor keeps him alive, meaning that he will never truly be free. That is, until Nightcrawler teleports his head off of his body, resulting in Wade dying despite being able to regrow limbs to a much easier extent than his 616 version. But hey, what am I gonna do? It's kind. And it ate Dreadpool. In the reality of Earth 12101, the X Men brought Deadpool to Dr. Benjamin Brighton in an attempt to cure him of his insanity. Unbeknownst to the X Men, however, Brighton had in actuality been brainwashing his patients to do his bidding as opposed to curing them. Brighton's treatment failed to brainwash Deadpool and instead destroyed his inner voices, replacing them with a single voice that knew the entire universe was just a lie and encouraged him to kill nonstop. He then killed Dr. Brighton by smashing him into a release form. After after stating all the form needed was Brighton's stamp of approval. And by stamp he meant his blood. He then killed everyone in the asylum and then blew up the building. In order to end it all, he began killing the rest of the heroes of the world, and he started by going after the Fantastic Four, killing Reed Richards and the Thing first, then proceeding to kill the Human Torch. But Susan Storm caught up to him and blew his head off with a force field. But while she was grieving over the death of her family, Deadpool regenerated his head and killed her. Because <laughs> of course he did. This version is a maniac, and honestly, I'm here for it. And at 7, Dogpool. Dogpool was once a dog known as Wilson, who was used as an animal test subject for Mascara X, which was intended to be a mascara that continually replenished itself after only one application. Instead, Mascara X disfigured Wilson and gave him the ability to heal from any wound. The lab owners didn't realize that he had acquired this ability and tossed him in a dumpster. Wilson tore free of the trash bag and wandered around, rejected by all those who saw him, until he threw himself in front of a car. A circus truck saw it happen and stopped for him and immediately recognized the potential in his regenerative abilities, and he became the circus's starring act. He went from being exploited by makeup companies to exploited by the circus. The death-defying hound, Deadpool. He worked in the circus until the Deadpool of Earth-616 showed up and recruited him for the Deadpool Corps. But a goddamn dog version of Deadpool? Hell yeah, that's horrifying. It's a fucking dog that enjoys killing people from what I saw. And he can't die. Like, what the- when the hell do you think? It's gonna be cute? And it's 6, Galactopool. Galactopool is a member of the evil Deadpool Corps. He is seen to attack the remaining Deadpool Corps and their allies after they defeat the evil Deadpool Corps that was originally sent to kill them. But he's taken out when Lady Deadpool deliberately crashes the B. Arthur into his head. But, uh, let's be honest. Even if he did die, a combination of Galactus and Deadpool is certainly a terrifying concept. Like, if we talk about it, I feel like it's still giving this guy too much power. Like, what sounds even the slightest bit okay about this version of Deadpool? The only reason he isn't higher on this list is because we didn't really get much of an opportunity to see his powers in action. But assuming he had all the powers of Galactus, this is probably the strongest version of Deadpool there is. But this isn't the list of the strongest alternate versions of Deadpool, it's scariest. And while this idea is scary, with no real situations to back it up, we don't know if this is a truly scary version in practice. Number 5, The Merciless. This alternate version of Bruce is one who ends up wielding the power of Ares in the memory of Wonder Woman. Oh yeah, and he's also the one who fought with Diana to the very end against Ares before he inevitably was kind of forced to kill her. Or forced in his eyes, but in our eyes we're like, Bruce, don't do that. Don't do it. This alternate version of Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, hails from the dark multiverse of Earth at negative 42 and is one of the Batman who laughs dark nights. To me, he represents Bruce's obsession with power and symbolizes what could very well happen if this was left unchecked. Bruce here loved Diana, but still ended up betraying her because he knew that she would not allow him to keep the power of Ares for himself and that she would rather destroy such power. So he was like, I gotta hold on to the power because I'm doing great with it. So I guess I gotta kill ya. But also, he wasn't doing that great with it. Spoiler alert. Number four, The Bruce. This alternate version of Batman comes to us from the reality belonging to Batman I Joker. Here, Batman is a tyrant and a symbol who is worshipped as a god. This is not our own Bruce Wayne, by the way, but like a dystopian, almost cyberpunk future version of the character where the people of Gotham see him as their ruler and god. In fact, I don't even know if this guy's name is actually Bruce Wayne or is Bruce at all. I think he's just a person that's elected and like that's the role you play. 
or that seized power. The people of Gotham worship him and his mission for vengeance. The whole comic is pretty horrifying to read and reveals how even the best of heroic intentions can be perverted over time. Nothing scarier than just humanity and the way that we think things through and can like take a good idea and make it into something a lot more sinister. That's the scariest thing of them all. Well, almost. There's a few more points. Number three, Murder Machine. Murder Machine is an alternate version of Bruce Wayne who hails from the dark multiverse reality of Earth and Negative 44. Here, Bruce Wayne turns to his friend and colleague Cyborg for help, building an AI to supplement Alfred after Bruce's longtime friend, butler, and father figure is tragically murdered. However, this AI is programmed to protect Bruce at all costs, which ends up leading the Alfred Protocol, as it's named here, to take over Bruce, replacing his human body with a mechanical, indestructible, and immortal one. Turning Bruce into the murder machine, the Alfred Protocol, which Bruce is now fully merged with, also takes away Bruce's ability to feel fear or sadness. I think you know where this is going. It's not going to a good place. In the end, it labels everyone a threat to Bruce and helps him to kill all those who could potentially harm him, including the entire Justice League. Pretty bleak stuff. Number 2. Nemesis Nemesis is probably one of the most brutal Batman alternates we have ever encountered. Probably also because he doesn't even hail from DC Comics himself, but instead is a creation of Mark Miller's, who hails from Icon Comics. Mark Miller doesn't hail from Icon Comics, but this character does. Mark Miller does many things. While we do have an elaborate backstory for Nemesis, which involves him also seeking vengeance for the death of his parents, but in a much more twisted way, since his parents were actually the worst kind of wealthy folks and murderers themselves, it's never really even confirmed that this backstory is the true backstory of Nemesis. In fact, it's even implied in the story that Nemesis could actually be multiple people who just cause mayhem and death and destruction because, well, maybe they just enjoy it? The whole idea of the character and everything that he does is pretty messed up and is quite dark. Nemesis provides a much more villainous take on the idea of vigilantes and how motivation can mess you up, or alternatively, how you really don't even need motivation to become a messed up and brutal vigilante in the first place. Also power. Lots of things about power because that's how it goes. Number 1. Batman Who Laughs Obviously one of the darkest and scariest alternate versions of Batman out there has to be the Batman Who Laughs. This version of Batman is actually like an amalgamation of Joker and Batman, but he is ultimately an alternate of Bruce Wayne because he is Bruce Wayne, so a little more Bruce really than Joker in the end. He used to fight crime as Batman, but one day Joker took things too far and caused Batman to snap. And not just snap internally, but externally as well, when he actually snapped Joker's neck, killing him. Joker released a special brand of Joker venom with his last breath, which Bruce breathed in. Over time, this venom made him paranoid and homicidal, and ultimately, he became the villain of the story, going so far as to kill all the members of the Bat family, knowing they would not be able to join him, or not be willing to join him I guess I should say. Well, he killed all of them at least except one. His son Damian Wayne was offered a spot at his father's side, and he ended up taking it. Batman then became the insane Batman who laughs and set out to conquer and reshape the entire multiverse. Which definitely means you're pretty scary. If you are like, I'm not just gonna take over this world, I'm gonna like, go beyond that. That's a lot. Starting off our list with an honorable mention at number 10, we have the Black Panther of the Marvel Zombieverse. Now, despite hailing from the universe literally called the Marvel Zombieverse, this incarnation of T'Challa is less scary himself, but more so just horrifying what winds up happening to him. After avoiding the initial outbreak of the zombie virus that managed to take out a large chunk of the world's superhuman population, T'Challa is betrayed by Hank Pym, aka Giant Man, and forced to be preserved as a food source for the former hero so that Hank can continue to focus on his research. Losing both an arm and a leg, T'Challa was only able to escape by teaming up with the zombified head of the Wasp, aka Janet Van Dyne. Coming in at number 9, we have the Black Black Panther of Earth 2301, aka the Marvel Mangaverse. Now, while usually the only frightening thing about manga is the amount of chapters I have to catch up on, the weirdest part of this section of the Marvel multiverse has got to be its unique take on Black Panther's powers. Rather than science or the heart-shaped herb of Wakanda, this version of T'Challa gets his powers directly from the Egyptian god Horus, and is 
it's capable of transforming into a literal Black Panther when he needs to for combat. Weirdly enough, Horus also gifts T'Challa the ability to grow a falcon's wings as well, so he might just have to argue with Sam Wilson about that if he doesn't want to get sued. Coming in at number 8, we have the Black Panther from the Ultimate Marvel Universe. In this slightly darker take on the Marvel Universe, gaining the title of Black Panther required T'Challa to literally defeat a Wakandan Panther in a combat ritual, a task he was able to accomplish, but at the cost of having his throat slashed and severely injured. To save his son, T'Challa's father sent him overseas to be healed in the Weapon X program, the same torturous experiments that resulted in the Wolverine. Thus, this Black Panther has incredible healing abilities and adamantium claws, meaning that along with the vibranium of Wakanda, this version of the hero is wielding both of the most powerful metals in the Marvel Universe. Coming in at number 7, we've got to go with Cole Tiger, the son of T'Challa from the alternate future of the MC2 universe. Named T'Chaka II after his grandfather, Cole Tiger hasn't yet become the King of Wakanda, but that doesn't doesn't stop him from fighting for his people. In a twist, T'Chaka's increased strength and speed are only available to him in his panther form, in which he literally transforms into a human-panther hybrid with incredibly deadly claws and fangs. Yeah, the Black Panther suit has always been at least a little bit intimidating, but getting chewed on by a super strong panther man seems like a bit more of a handful. Coming in at number 6, we've got Black Panther 2099. In an alternate future, Future, the villainous Doctor Doom has invaded and completely taken over Wakanda, and the only hope lies in the hands of the Resistance and a new man who has taken up the mantle of the Black Panther, Kashamba. Using the powers of the heart-shaped herb, Kashamba at first seems to be a worthy successor to the mantle, with all of the powers that T'Challa had during his time as king. However, the dark twist at the end of this storyline reveals that even in victory, this version of Black Panther is nothing more than a pawn for Victor Von Doom, showing a defeated man sitting on the throne of Wakanda a very horrifying sight indeed. Number 5. Mortal Hulk Immortal Hulk, or Devil Hulk, as he is sometimes referred to, only comes out at night and is the most powerful type of Hulk to this very day. This Hulk doesn't come out any other time. Even if Bruce starts getting mad, or even if he dies, he just waits for night. It's very creepy. This series came out after Bruce Banner was killed during Civil War II. After Bruce Banner, who was dead for two years, reappears in the comics, the Hulk that he is connected to is Immortal Hulk. He has massive amounts of gamma power, can also drain gamma, and can sense if people are lying to him. Number 4. Superior Spider-Man so, in 2013, Marvel Comics released a limited series storyline, Superior Spider-Man. In this iteration of Spider-Man, Peter Parker dies. Yeah, you heard that right. But Otto Octavius, aka Dr. Octopus, implants his mind in Peter's body so he, that he can become the superior Spider-Man. He's basically trying to show him wielding Spider-Man abilities that he himself would be a better Spider-Man and a better Peter Parker than actual Peter himself. I highly doubt that they would try to adapt the storyline in the MCU by killing off one of its biggest superheroes they have to allow just Doc Ock to become a new web slinger. Number three, The Punisher. So The Punisher, aka Frank Castle, has had many adaptations in the past, with his most recent one being from Netflix's The Punisher series. Now, the series was canceled, and we never got 100% confirmation that the series was connected to the MCU movies division, especially with Kevin Feige, who is a producer on the MCU, on the MCU films, being involved with the Disney Plus Marvel series now. So, this character is quite dark, and especially knowing and seeing his backstory and what we have seen from the adaptation so far, that would be quite the contrast for the MCU, who try to make these films as family friendly as they can. Now yes, you could try and tone down the violence, but that kind of would probably annoy a lot of fans. Frank Castle's backstory is that his family is killed and that he's trying to get revenge and kill those responsible. Number two, Damien Hellstrom. So Hellstorm, aka Damien Hellstrom, wow, those are very similar names, was created in the 1970s by Roy Thomas and Gary Frederick. He is also referred to as Hellstorm, but also can be called the son of Satan. Damien is the literal son of Satan and a human. He did not want to embrace the side of his father, but rather the human side of his mother. When he was in the Hell Dimension, his powers are limitless. He can use magic and supernatural abilities to his advantage. His weapon is a trident, which helps him harness his supernatural abilities. There will be an adaptation of this character on the Hulu TV series called Hellstrom, but I highly doubt that this will actually connect to the MCU. Number one, Sentry. So Sentry is literally probably the scariest superhero Marvel has. 
and that's why it would be hard to use him in the MCU. Sentry was created by Paul Jenkins, Jay Lee, and Rick Fetch in 2000. He's sort of like Marvel Superman, just like a really dark version. He also could arguably be the most powerful superhero in the Marvel Universe. Sentry, also referred to as the Void, which was an evil entity created in his mind that clashes with Sentry. The Void and Sentry are linked together. The sad thing is that even though the Sentry is a hero and saves countless people, when the Void comes out, he will just kill as many people as Sentry saves. And a 10 tangent. The Superman of Earth tangent was originally a human named Harvey Dent, who gained superpowers through a freak accident. He became one of the top superheroes however after defeating Ultra Humanite, who on this Earth was created by a US government super soldier project. He became too powerful to be controlled and then threatened to destroy the world. Yeah. But after the death of Superman's wife, he became dark and vengeful, taking over the world. While he protected the world from crime, he was still tyrannical, not allowing any freedom of thought. And this is where the story of Tangent Superman's reign begins. I don't know why Superman is so codependent on Lois, or whoever his wife ends up being. Cause like, whenever he loses his wife, he ends up going berserk. Like bro, you literally just like, you lost your whole planet. I think like one death, even if it is the love of your life, isn't gonna be that much. I mean, this version didn't lose his home planet, but like, still. Other versions in this list, you get it. And at 9, Subject B0. Subject B0, also known as the Monster, was a creation of Lex Luthor, presumably used to combat Superman, but was taken out of stasis early to help combat Ultraman and the Crime Syndicate. Despite being the creation of Luthor, B0 had a gentle heart and simply wished to enjoy the beauty of life and to make his father proud. Although imbued with Kryptonian-like powers, B0 was easily overpowered and killed by Ultraman, much to the grief of his father who actually grew to love him. So while not an evil version of Superman, you have to admit, if this guy was running at you, you'd be pretty damn terrified. Like, bro, get some skin cream, some moisturizer. You look like a rock gnome named Deborah Mustard. Come on. Next thing you know, you're gonna try to control me with one word and then make me a little robot trinket that's gonna get stolen by a goblin who only wants to eat pigeons. And look, you may not understand that reference, but if you do, we need to, we're friends now, okay? And it ain't bizarro. The original Bizarro was created when Superman was exposed to a duplicate ray in accordance with the science fiction concepts of, stu of Superman's stories of the yeah it there was a lot of sci-fi going on with Superman. However, Bizarro relocated to the Bizarro world, a cuboidal planet called Hetre, which is just Earth backwards, don't really know how to pronounce it, but it operated under Bizarro logic. So like it was a crime to do anything good, and basically since Bizarro was the invert of Superman, he that Earth was also populated by inverts of other DC characters. The 1986 event Crisis on Infinite Earths though rewrote DC's continuity, and eliminating that Earth. Since then, two different Bizarro characters have appeared. One of them was a flawed clone created by Lex Luthor, and the second, the longer lasting Bizarro, was an idea of the Batman villain the Joker, brought to life by the cosmic trickster Mr. Mitzi's Pitalik. He was first introduced in Superboy number 68 from 1958 though, and is even one of the coolest Superman versions there is, even, even if he's not always like actually Superman and rather like an experiment, but like, whatever. And it's seven, Justice Lord. For much of his life, Justice Lord's Superman background matched the Justice League counterpart, until President Lex Luthor executed the Flash. Soon after that, Superman stormed the White House while his comrades battled the Secret Service. And as they were doing that, Superman confronted President Luthor in the Oval Office. Despite Superman's accusations of corruption and abuse of power, Luthor refused to surrender and arrogantly stated that he would find a way to get out of prison, or at least avoid being prosecuted to begin with. Superman declared that if being a hero meant that this feuding and fighting had to continue, then he was done with it, and then used his heat vision to execute the president on the spot, Shazam style. After President Luther's assassination, the Justice Lords spent the next two years imposing their brand of peace on the earth through harsh rule. Justice Lord Superman himself continued to use his heat vision to lobotomize all of Earth's criminals and supervillains. As a result, all of them became harmless, walking vegetables who obediently inhabited the world's prisons. Which I mean, like, is a little tamer than some versions of Superman. Like, lobotomy or death. Honestly, I don't know which would be considered more evil. In its sixth kingdom comes Superman. Yet another world where Lois Lane dies. <laughs> Except this time it's directly at the hands of the Joker, who had flooded the Daily Planet with his toxin, killing everyone but Lois who had managed to locate a gas mask. When trying to attack the Joker, however, Joker just turns around and cracks her right in the skull. Superman returns as Lois succumbs to her injuries and dies. And as for the Joker, he arrives for his trial, but he's killed by a new superhero going by Magog. However, 
Magog ends up getting acquitted of his charges after killing the Joker, which honestly, I understand, but Superman is appalled by the public embracing a killer as a hero. Already disheartened at the death of Lois, Kal-El abandons his life as Superman and retreats to his Fortress of Solitude where he spends the next decade. Superman eventually returns and reforms the Justice League though, with the goal of capturing heroes who took Magog's example and started killing, which results in many a battle and a nuke targeted towards metahuman genes, a la Invasion, the CW crossover. But in the end, Superman does end up dating Wonder Woman and they end up expecting a child. I mean, like, uh, it took you a while, but you got over it. Attaboy. Number 5. Old Man Logan Definitely one of the scariest alternate versions of Wolverine out there when it comes to the reality in which he resides. Old Man Logan hails from the alternate reality of Earth 807128. In this reality, it was Wolverine himself who was responsible for the death of the X-Men as he was tricked by Mysterio into slaughtering all of them when the villains took over and ended up finally winning the day. Flash forward to the future where Wolverine is old and he doesn't go by that codename anymore because well, it brings back pretty painful memories, which he still is haunted by to this day. Instead, he's simply known as Logan. But even though he tries to stay away from heroics, retiring, and even settling down with a wife and kids, he can't seem to escape his vigilante ways. After his family are killed when he is late to pay forced protection money to the Hulk gang, Logan himself seeks revenge, inevitably and gruesomely freeing pretty much everyone from the villainous nature of deranged Pappy Banner and his inbred family. That Hulk gang. Oh boy. Number 4. Cancer vs Wolverine We don't know that much about Cancer vs Wolverine, who hails from the Earth of 10011, but we do know like many others who hail from this reality, Wolverine here is horrifying to behold, and he is part of the X-Men, spelt E-X-Men. In the Cancer verse, death was completely eradicated, which you might think would bring about a sort of paradise in the cosmos, but instead this change had, well, the opposite effect, mutating everything into one big horror show. Turns out death wasn't quite as bad as we all thought, and that life, left unchecked, is actually horrifying. Who would have guessed? Number 3, X-24 In the film Logan, X-24 was an even more deadly clone than X-23. This was a cloned version of Wolverine genetically engineered to be as powerful as Wolverine in his prime, perhaps even more so, and who was much more easy to control and manipulate. Not as free thinking, and just more of a straight up berserker. So basically like Wolverine without any of his moral code at all, or any in inhibitions. This made X-24 the perfect weapon to be used against Wolverine himself and escapee Laura, aka X-23. It took a lot to take down X-24 and his perceived strength and ruthlessness in the film made him a terrifying nemesis to watch. I don't know about you, but I got so anxious every time he showed up on screen in that initial watch through of Logan. Ugh, even even when I rewatch it now, I'm like, Ugh, Logan, no, X-24 is coming for you, run! Number 2, Lord of the Vampires This alternate version of Wolverine comes to us from the What If series, Volume 2. Two, issue 24. Here, the fate of the world was forever changed when, during the X Men's battle with Dracula, Storm ultimately decided to remain with Dracula. This changed the course of history forever as Wolverine and the other heroes were captured and transformed into vampires themselves. However, Wolverine's willpower proved much too strong for Dracula to tame or control. And so, he was challenged and later defeated by Wolverine, who then became the new Lord of the Vampires. What's scarier than a Terminator style clone version of Wolverine? How about a vampire version of Wolverine who rules over all of the other vampires and can turn anyone into his loyal thrall? Number 1. Zombieverse Wolverine Actually, I feel a little bad that I put the zombies above the vampires in this list, but here we are. I don't know how, but I almost actually forgot to mention Zombie vs Wolverine on this list. I guess maybe it's just because I'm so fixated on vampires, which I guess makes sense. But it's really shocking considering how emotionally scarring and overall how terrifying I find the Zombie verse in Marvel to be. It's just just a real horror show over there. Over on Earth Z or Earth 2149, Wolverine isn't just any old zombie either, but becomes one of the zombie cosmic or zombie galacti. After he and a group of chosen few fight over and successfully devour Galactus's remains. For a long time, this granted zombie Wolverine the power cosmic, so not only was he now a terrifying member of the undead with Wolverine's killer instincts and fighting prowess, but then he also had the power cosmic on top of that. Wow. In a 10 reverse flash. 
Now I know what you're thinking, but isn't Eobard known as the villain reverse Flash? But he's, he's a villain, he's not Barry. Okay, look, all right, I get it. In the main continuity, yes, but in the dark multiverse Flashpoint story, Eobard actually becomes the Flash, and he kind of became his own form of hero in a way, like a dark, twisted, messed up hero hellbent on eradicating the human race and just subjugating all superheroes to his will, but hey, but it's still kind of a hero, right? Technically it counts. And I mean, like, he's still scary and another version of the Flash, so yes, it does. This is a universe where Barry Allen dies while trying to get his powers back with Flashpoint Batman, aka Thomas Wayne. But he, he dies and... The reverse Flash kind of takes his place. But once he tries to stop the war between Aquaman and Wonder Woman by threatening them and killing Arthur, you know that there's going to be some hell to pay. So he sets out on shaping the world into his own image. This involves preventing Batman from ever becoming Batman and instead creating his own superhero team full of versions of the characters we know and love, but all with reverse Flash logos somewhere on their suits, usually. And I have to say, preventing Batman from being created is probably the smartest thing that Eobard has ever done, or could have done in this situation, because either way, no matter who becomes Batman, Batman is always going to lead some form of resistance. So by eliminating Batman being created, you, you stopped just a resistance rising against you, so good on you. In a nine gorilla, Grodd Flash. Grodd friended me is the 13th episode of the sixth season of The Flash, and is the 127th episode overall. In this episode, Grodd comes to Barry as a projection of Joe, and tells Barry that he is aware of his progressions made post-crisis. He asks Barry to assist him with getting to the gorilla city that is now on Earth Prime, so he can at least be happy among his own kind, because currently he was locked up at Argus. Barry realizes that they have to try something new and overlook the past and they need to work together to beat the Salivar that is in Grodd's mind. Barry and Grodd combine their brains briefly, giving Grodd super speed powers. Barry tells Team Flash what's going on, and Frost discovers that on the off chance that they don't end up separating their brains the exact moment that they escape, they're both going to die. While in the Mindscape though, Barry educates Grodd on how to utilize his speed against Salivar, and he succeeds with Barry's help. Barry awakens in reality, successfully disconnected from Grodd's mind. So yeah, a telepathic psychic gorilla with super Super speed after combining with the fastest man alive. Yeah, that's gonna be a no for me, dog. Actually, though, it was a pretty sick episode. And it ate Speed Demon. Speed Demon, first introduced in Speed Demon number one, is aside from what your ex girlfriends might have called you, a combination of Barry Allen and Johnny Blaze. Blaze Allen was a circus daredevil who sold his soul to become the first Speed Demon. And yes, there are multiple. The demon component Etrigan was actually formerly Jay Garrick before the Night Spectre stole Jay's soul. The Night Spectre approached Blaze and asked him to serve in his mission to collect the souls of the most pure and the most corrupt, which just sounds like a dream job to me, but whatever. Blaze Allen refused, so in an attempt to persuade him at his wedding, Night Spectre stole his wife's soul. He stole Iris's soul. Yep. Blaze then accepted the bond, hoping to get Iris back, or at least ensure her safety, but of course, he he pulls back. That's not gonna happen, bro. Speed Demon speaks only in rhymes, but is a speedster with a flaming skull head that can also breathe hellfire. Wally West, an amalgam of Danny Ketch and obviously Wally West, was the next Speed Demon who accepted the power in order to help his uncle get Iris back. It's interesting because, like, I would give up my soul for super speed? Are you kidding me? And the ability to breathe fire? Speaking in rhymes is great. Yeah, that's right. You better not hate. And it's seven, Mercury Flash. Mercury Flash is a robotic version of the Flash made by Doc Tornado as a member of his Metal League. The robot uses a Mercury-based physiology, whatever that means, that can make it somehow able to channel the speed force, and like the actual speed force, not even a fake one. I don't understand how this man not only learned about the speed force, but was also able to replicate or siphon it off using Mercury, but whatever. It's comics, okay? You don't really need an, an explanation as long as it helps the plot. First being introduced in the Multiversity Guidebook number one in March of 2015. This version of the Flash can do everything the normal Flash can do powers wise, but because, you know, he's, he's a robot, can't really do human activities. But he also has the added advantage of being a robot, so he doesn't really fear death. Not only is it in his code to not fear death, but he can also just be repaired. This version of the Flash hails from Earth 44, and I kinda really wanna be him. 
No responsibilities, only running super fast and drinking motor oil. That's the dream. And it's Six Savitar. As a fan of the Arrowverse, I, I had to include this one, okay? He's one of the most interesting speedsters on the show. Savitar, while sharing a name with another evil speedster from the comics, is actually revealed to be a time remnant of Barry Allen, being more of a future Flash than actual Savitar. He's a combination of the two. His story is pretty messed up, in essence making himself to have a classic chicken and the egg scenario, as Cisco would put it, where he caused himself to be created. In the post-Flashpoint Arrowverse timeline, Savitar comes back from the future to kill Iris West before her and Barry get married. Buried. This causes Barry to create as many time remnants as possible in order to stop him, but Savitar kills them all except for one. The one that he spares ends up getting shunned by the rest of Team Flash for not being the real Barry Allen, even though he still technically is the real Barry. It's weird. So in an act of fury, the time remnant runs back in time, creating a new identity for himself as the first speedster and the god of speed called Savitar. And then he comes back. It's uh, He burns his face at some point, and then he tries to kill what would have been his wife, and he like remembers everything he's in love with her but he just he still tries to kill her yeah I, I don't get it but it's it's still pretty damn scary coming in at number five we've got to go with the Black Panther from Earth X another alternate version of the character that's a bit more cat like than the normally human T'Challa this version is actually permanently stuck as a panther human hybrid rather than just being an attack form he can change into and out of at will like the Kolb tiger could after the Terrigen mists began to spread on Earth, many animals within Wakanda also began to grow more human in appearance, leaving the Black Panther as the leader of not only the Wakandan people, but an army of animen that grew frustrated at their current situation. Definitely one of the weirder takes on a very iconic character. Coming in at number 4, we have the horrifying creature known as the Spider Virus Panther. During the event called Spider Island, a villain known fittingly enough as the Spider Queen used Peter Parker's DNA to create a virus that would initially just give people additional powers similar to Spider-Man, but would eventually mutate them into horrific half-arachnid, half-human beings. With multiple limbs, eyes, and a thirst for blood, this version of T'Challa with all of the powers of both the Black Panther and Spider-Man in a single terrifying form, this creature prowled the halls of the Museum of Natural History and definitely would be more frightening than anything else you'd find in that building. Coming in at number 3, we've got to go with the mashup hero of Ghost Panther. During the Infinity Warps event, which led to multiple Marvel heroes being combined together in a new universe with half as many inhabitants, Black Panther and Ghost Rider were combined together to become, you guessed it, the Ghost Panther. Adding Hellfire manipulation to Black Panther's power set would be reason enough to be scared of this version of the hero, but combined with a flaming skull head and eternally riding a fiery panther steed, and this is one Black Panther you don't want to mess with. Coming in at number 2, we have Azuri, the grandfather of the Black Panther. During the era of World War II, Wakanda was still isolated from the rest of the world and protected by Azuri, a Black Panther with the ability to raise and control the dead like a necromancer. Combined with his talent with the machete-style weapons that left him unafraid to decapitate his foes to send a message, and this version of Black Panther was an intimidating obstacle whenever Captain America briefly showed up on Wakanda's door doorstep. And honestly, it's a good thing that Cap was able to keep his head. And coming in with our final slot, we've got to go with the venom-wielding Black Panther of an alternate reality, Ngozi. In a world where the original Black Panther falls in battle against the Rhino while protecting Nigeria, a track student Ngozi bonds with a symbiote in order to protect her friends. Impressing the Wakandan warriors nearby, Ngozi is taken back to their homeland and eventually earns the title of the new Black Panther, but with her own violent symbiote twist. With all the powers of both the heart-shaped herb and the venom symbiote, Ngozi is definitely a foe to fear. And it's at Superior Spider-Man. Superior Spider-Man is actually Otto Octavius, who prior to the Superior Spider-Man storyline had brain swapped with Peter. Yet a piece of Peter still remained in his own body and didn't die in Otto's body, which ended up convincing Otto to be a hero, albeit a darker one. This small bit of Peter that was left in his body was also trying to regain control, for obvious reasons because you know a superhero was piloting 
piloting his bone mech. This small bit of Peter though was at times able to interfere or even control Otto temporarily. One of these moments came in Superior Spider-Man number 8, where there was a device that was capable of wiping Peter from Otto's brain, but to get the actual item, Otto had to perform surgery on a little girl. However, Peter didn't think that Otto was actually able to do it, so he tries to stop Otto from even performing the surgery, but he also didn't want him to get the thing that would wipe him from his brain. Also, Otto did this surgery while having his Spider-Man mask on and an additional face mask. But either way, this version of Spider-Man was definitely more ruthless and willing to kill since he was still technically a supervillain. And a 9 Kane. The clone that would come to be known as Kane was the Jackal's first attempt at cloning Peter Parker. Initially thought to be a success, Kane eventually became deformed to do a flaw in the cloning process. And he continued to degenerate and he was left further deformed and mentally unstable. <laughs> Aren't we all? The Jackal allowed Kane to live as like a test subject to see how long he would be able to survive and it ended up exceeding Jackal's expectations. As a result though, Kane experienced a strong feeling of rejection that might might be kind of like a father-son kind of thing, you know that, you know what I mean. Kane left and realized that the degeneration that had caused his mental state to decline had also amplified his powers that he had genetically kind of inherited from Peter. His strength, speed, stamina, and agility were also comparable to those of Peter, but he also gained precognitive powers as well, which showed him flashes of the future, which seemed to be sort of an amplified spider sense. He also possessed a mark of Kane, which was a corrosive touch that that he used to leave eaten away handprints on victims' faces, which is pretty damn scary if you ask me. Also, if you're enjoying this video and want to see more, be sure you hit that like button and subscribe because it really helps us out against the algorithm almighty. Also, I'm dressed as Spider-Man and talking about Spider-Man, so I feel like that's worth a like. And it ain't pestilence, Spider-Man. When Apocalypse started his plans for world domination, he captured four people who he saw as being good enough to be his horsemen and corrupted them. Spider-Man became the horseman known as Pestilence. Pestilence was one of the horsemen that Deadpool, Cannonball, and Siren encountered in their alternate reality search for Cable. And even though Pestilence was accompanied in the fight by Famine and Archangel, all three of them were defeated. This version of Peter Parker has the same powers as his 616 counterpart, except this time they've been augmented by Apocalypse when he corrupted them. But I mean, like a Spider-Man who is literally a horseman of the Apocalypse and asks people if they will scream while he sucks the marrow from their bones, I think it's safe to say that this guy's pretty damn scary. And he made his first appearance in 2005, which makes this character around the same age that Peter was when he got his powers, which is kind of ironic. He hails from Earth 5701, which is the age of Apocalypse Earth. And it's Evan Ghost Spider. Ghost Spider comes from Earth 11638, and in this reality, Peter Parker's Uncle Ben never died, and actually ended up helping Peter to train as a hero with his new spider powers, becoming the Amazing Spider, a famous and popular superhero who also became a rich and successful scientist, having his own company called Parker Technologies. With his resources and motivation from Uncle Ben, the Amazing Spider used transportation technology to bring Spider-Men from other universes to his and absorb their powers to increase his. After bringing the Spider-Man from Earth 616 to his Earth though and making him believe that he arrived in this universe by accident, the Amazing Spider was weakened by the feedback of the dimensional portal. Eventually, the Amazing Spider was convinced that what he was doing was not in fact heroic and allowed himself to die. But after dying, the Sorcerer Supreme of Dr. Banner yeah, infused Peter's spirit that was trapped in hell with the powers of the damned, causing him to become a form of Ghost Rider, calling himself the Ghost Spider. And honestly, this is one of the baddest spider suits of all time. I love it. If I could figure out a way to cosplay this, I would. And it's six, Zombie Spider-Man. Okay, so technically this is Spider-Man, but it's a zombie version of Spider-Man, but I'm gonna count it anyway, because this is pretty damn messed up, zombie or not. On Earth 2149, an alien plague ends up infecting all superpowered individuals and turns them into zombies. However, it's later revealed that the Necronomicon from the Evil Dead was actually what caused this plague. But after learning that the plague was really bad, since I guess the fact that they were calling it a plague wasn't enough, or the fact that the world had to shut down so the population wasn't wiped out, Peter ran home to get Ant-Man and Mary Jane the hell out of Dodge. But when he got there, we got a good old case of Parker Luck, protagonist syndrome. Boom, zombie spider. He ends up becoming a zombie as soon as he gets home and eats the two most important women in his life. He also fractured his jaw before becoming a zombie so he could 
open his mouth more, I guess. Or kind of like, kind of like man spider it. Yeah, it's not a pretty sight. Like even by zombie standards, it's ew. halfway through in a number five Wolverine pool. Wade Wilson from Earth TRN 1946 was bonded with adamantium to his skeleton by Weapons Plus, this their version of the Weapon X program. He was later recruited by Deadpool for his army. He killed Deadpool Pulp before the arrival of Galactopool. He was attacked by Deadpool with a grenade from which bugs came out of and then ate all of his flesh, leaving behind only a skeleton and claws, which is horrifying. His powers are seemingly the same as Earth 616 Wolverine but like with Deadpool's body. So I mean, okay, that's we it's weird because he looks like Deadpool, but he is also Wolver it's it's weird, okay? Wolverine Pool's healing factor though is most likely weaker than the 616 version of either Wolverine or Deadpool's healing factor, which makes him less dangerous, but come on. A combination of Wolverine and Deadpool is something that we should all fear and most likely do fear. I'm surprised Deadpool didn't make this a thing at the end of Deadpool 2 though when he was correcting everything that he did wrong, including the Green Lantern movie, which was actually Ryan Reynolds, but hey. And at 4, Evil Deadpool. The origins of the being known as Evil Deadpool are actually tied to Ella Whitby, a British psychiatrist obsessed with this superhuman mercenary Deadpool. She she collected numerous parts of Deadpool's body that he had lost over the years and kept them in her freezer. When Deadpool found them though, he threw them in a dumpster in disgust. Which is weird, because I mean you're Deadpool, why are you disgusted? It's your own body, but whatever. The parts eventually thawed out and since it still had Deadpool's healing factor, they all decided to fuse together into a single person. Evil Deadpool hijacked the private plane of an American businessman and traveled to the United States around the same time the original Deadpool did. And the two crafts passed for the first time after the Evil Deadpool blew up Deadpool's favorite chimichanga joint and they fought until they ran out of bullets. Both Deadpools agreed for a second round at Canarsie Park though. Their second explosive encounter caught the attention of Captain America who arrived to the scene after Evil Deadpool had escaped. But yeah, he's the whole reason for like the whole Deadpool core, so pretty fucking scary dude. Getting close to the end in a number three, Death Mask. After a revolutionary procedure performed by Reed Richards removed a lethal brain tumor, Wade Wilson became a super genius and used his newfound intellect to erect a criminal empire. Wade began wearing wearing armor styled after Doctor Doom and went by Death Mask. After killing Death Wish, which was Victor Von Doom, who was the Deadpool of this reality, that the Deadpool of the mainstream continuity was actually quite fond of, Death Mask decided to take down his alter ego. After being defeated, Death Mask made a contract with Mephisto to unleash monsters to Earth, including the demon Infernal Hulk. Not to mention that he has the powers of Deadpool and Doctor Doom, with an even cooler color scheme than the original Doctor Doom. But ultimately, in a number two, Venom Pool. Venom Pool is an alternate reality version of Deadpool from Earth 90211. He is the combination of Deadpool and the Venom symbiote. Being a part of Earth 90211, he is part of the reality Beyonder loves partying in. A reality that's perpetually stuck in the 1980s in many regards, much like my father. Venom Pool is the Beyonder's go-to party animal, until the party gets boring for the Beyonder. But Deadpool was actually originally meant to kill Beyonder before discovering how much he liked the partying lifestyle. And once Spider-Man showed up demanding that the Beyonder remove the symbiote, this is when Deadpool becomes Venom Pool. He is later seen in one of the evil Deadpool's evil Deadpool core, and he is presumably killed shortly after this point, but then we still don't know. His appearance changed rather drastically in the time between What If Venom possessed Deadpool number one and Deadpool kills Deadpool number two. In his initial appearance, Venom Pool looked like he was a cross between Venom, Deadpool, and Rick James, and in his recent appearances, he just he looks like Deadpool but with like a Venom mouth and more ripped. And finally, in a number one, Poison Deadpool. The poisons are a species of crystalline extraterrestrials spawned by the Poison Queen, originating on Earth 17952. The Poison spent an unknown amount of time as prey for larger, stronger creatures before discovering that they could assimilate symbiotes and their hosts to become more powerful. While hunting the Venom symbiote, they were discovered by an incarnation of Doctor Strange, who bonded to the symbiote and proceeded to recruit an army of Venomized superheroes, antiheroes, and supervillains from across the multiverse to stop the Poisons. However, the Poisons saw this as an opportunity to swell their ranks, and most of these recruits were either killed or assimilated. When Venom pulled was summoned to the earth dealing with these poisons, he ended up willingly surrendering himself to a group of poisons, thinking that the host's original personas were not completely extinguished, and banking on his insanity, granting him additional resistance to this process. This theory was proven correct though, as though his body was consumed to create poison Deadpool, his mind remained intact, and he was able to suppress that of the poison that had consumed him. So while Deadpool was uncertain how long he could suppress the poison psyche, he helped the resistance in infiltrate the poison's lair. Which I mean has gotta be one of the most Deadpool things that you could fucking do. Like, I'm 
super overpowered with the symbiote, so I'm going to willingly give myself over to these things that could potentially take over my mind, but I don't fucking care, because I'm going to be even more powerful, and then if I am crazy enough to just not have to deal with it, then I'm just going to help the good guys, because I don't fucking care. Jesus. Deadpool, man.